All right, so we're gonna pick up and start talking about DNA profiling. So this is another type of DNA technology. This is less um, about kind of human health and things like that, but one of the big ways that we've used DNA profiling, and this is basically the ability to determine if a DNA sample comes from an individual, but this is really important in forensics. So this is gonna be kind of the field um, that is for solving crimes and things like that. Okay, so for a definition, so DNA profiling, okay, is the analysis of DNA samples to determine whether they come from the same individual. All right, so this has really changed um, the field of forensics because prior to kind of DNA profiling becoming the technology that it is today. Many people were convicted of crimes based on evidence that, you know, there's lots of things like they used to look at hairs, but they weren't looking at DNA. They were just looking at the actual hair and seeing if it looks like it's the same color and the same kind of makeup. But we know that that is really not a good and very accurate way to kind of profile. And so once DNA profiling came about, um, it really kind of opened up this really good technique that can identify individuals. And we'll talk about how this process works and how accurate it can be um, to be able to determine if the sample that you got is actually from an individual, okay? We also will sometimes call this DNA fingerprinting. And I like that term because the way that DNA profiling is done, it is a way of looking at the DNA in a, in a way that is very unique to an individual. And so no two individuals are gonna have exactly the same DNA fingerprint, much like the fingerprints on our hands are unique to ourselves. Okay, and that's why they use fingerprinting for crimes as well. Um, so the DNA fingerprint is going to be a unique to you kind of signal um, that we'll be able to use. Now, in order to do DNA profiling and DNA fingerprinting, it requires a couple different techniques um, of DNA technology. And so uh, the techniques are gonna be, oops, that's nice about that. One of the big techniques is gonna be called PCR, which stands for polymerase chain reaction. Okay, and this word polymerase should sound familiar because we've talked about DNA polymerase and RNA polymerase. And so this is basically going to be able to make, in our case, it's going to make more DNA. And so the PCR, what its job is, is it's, the term they use lots of is amplifying, amplify DNA. What this word amplify means is to make more copies. So for example, if you have a very small DNA sample from a crime scene, say like you found a hair, you can then take that hair, extract the DNA, then make many, many copies of the DNA so you can then test it. You would not wanna use the original sample of DNA by itself because it's very small and once you've used it, it's gone. And so PCR allows us to make many, many copies of the DNA so that we can test it. Okay, and so one of the types of tests that we're gonna talk about is a DNA fingerprint. And so what you could have is you have a crime scene. And so for example, this is blood. Um, so maybe you found some of the blood on a victim and you can take the DNA from the blood. You can then go through a process of DNA amplification, which is PCR, okay? Make many, many copies of it and then do something called a DNA fingerprint. And so we'll talk about this stage down here in a little bit.
But the main thing right now we're talking about is this PCR. So how do we make a m many, many copies of the actual DNA, okay? So we're gonna go through the steps of PCR. And it's a three-step process. And this is what we talked about in lab this week. Okay. So you initially start with a, a little sample of DNA, okay? And so we want to make more copies of the DNA. And so what we can do is we can actually separate the DNA, DNA strands and then start to make new strands. So it's like the process of replication almost, okay? So the first step is that you have to do something called denature. And I've used this word before. What it means is that the DNA strand, you're actually going to heat it up so that they separate, Okay, and so denature is kind of, you're making it so they no longer are um, connected. So DNA is heated, and that makes strands separate. Okay, the next step is going to be called annealing. Okay. And so when you do annealing, what you're doing is you actually, you take the DNA and you cool it slightly. So DNA is cooled, so you lower the temperature. And we use something called a primer. Okay, and a primer is a short sequence of, it's either DNA or RNA. So very short sequence. Um, oops, I should have left it open. Primer short sequence of DNA or RNA that provides a starting point for DNA synthesis. Okay, and so what that is gonna do, it's gonna bind to the DNA. And I'll show you what this looks like in a second, okay? The last step is called extension. Okay, and during extension, DNA polymerase that you will have to provide for this process adds nucleotides, to the three prime end of the primer. Okay. So this is what this would look like. So we have our DNA sequence, okay? And the they're gonna, we're gonna ultimately separate these two strands and then we're gonna put on primers. And so these are the primers. They're, they're single stranded. They are just a sequence of DNA they are usually going to correspond to a targeted piece of T DNA, and we will not talk about how they make that because that's kind of getting out of the scope of this class, but a very specific part of the DNA that they're interested in, and it will then bind to that part of the DNA, and then the, the um, RNA polym DNA polymerase will come in and start adding on kind of the DNA strand. So you would then kind of continue to add on your DNA. Okay, so it would add on there, and this one would add on here. All right, so this is kind of what the whole process looks like. So you initially denature. This actually has the, the temperatures on it, and I wanna mention the temperatures because I'll speak about those in a second. So you denature it, you heat it up to 96 um, degrees Celsius, so this is very hot, um, like 158 degrees, or actually maybe it's a little bit less than that. Um, but it's gonna be very hot. It is gonna denature, so the strands are gonna separate. Then you add the primer. You have to uh, kind of reduce the heat because otherwise the primers will not bind. So you put the primers on and then at 72 degrees Celsius, and I will never ask you about these temperatures, just it is important to know it's at a higher temperature. You then will have extension of the primers. Okay, so DNA polymerase will come in here and start adding on the nucleotides, okay? then your result would be you now have four strands of DNA where you only had two strands. Now, there's a couple important points about this whole process. 
Okay, and I'm gonna talk kind of about the materials needed. And this is gonna be important for lab as well. So this is for PCR. So one of the things we need is a, a polymerase. Okay, now human polymerase is gonna work at human body temperature, okay? And human body temperature is going to be way lower than any of these temperatures right here. So human body temperature is 37 degrees Celsius. And so if we need to heat up the DNA to separate it, and then we keep it at 55 or 72, that is way too hot for kind of human polym our, um, DNA polymerase. I'm just going to put Paul. DNA polymerase, okay? So it's way too hot. So you cannot use human DNA polymerase here. However, what has been found is that there is a species of bacterium and the species is called Thermus aquaticus. Okay, and so it's a heat tolerant bacterium. Okay. And its DNA polymerase okay, is stable at 70 degrees Celsius, okay, which is right around the, the, the temperature of when extension is happening. So this is when DNA polymerase would be working. Okay? Because of it not being human, we call this TAC polymerase. Okay, so thermus aquaticus, so that's where the you have the T and the AQ. TAC polymerase is going to be the polymerase that is used for PCR. So that's really important. So you want to make sure you know that. Okay, and the reason why we use it is because it's heat tolerant and stable at 70 degrees Celsius. Okay, the other materials needed for this would you need nucleotides. Okay, so you, you need the bases basically. You need A's. T's, C's, and G's, okay? Because if you're making new DNA, you need to be able to have your nucleotides to then attach to your, your growing strand. And the last thing are those primers. Okay, so again, these are gonna be short pieces of single-stranded DNA or RNA. Okay. All right. So that's how the process works. So you start with a single piece of DNA strand. You can then do multiple cycles. And so if you do this for 20 to 30 cycles, you're going to end up with an enormous amount of DNA and that can then be used for testing. Okay. Now the way that we actually are going to be able to use this for DNA fingerprinting requires me to tell you a little bit about the sequences of DNA that we're looking at when we're doing these um, DNA profiling, okay? Because you don't want to use genes that are coding for proteins, like something that's important for glycolysis because every human is going to have exactly the same version of the gene, okay? Because if it's that important for life, it has to be conserved and it's not going to have any changes between humans. So you have to sh kind of target these areas on the genome that are not gene coding, Okay, and so these are going to call, be called short tandem repeats. Oops, repeat analysis. Okay, so short tandem repeat analysis, and this is going to be the area, the actual DNA that we use for DNA profiling. Okay. So short tandem repeat analysis is going to deal with something called repetitive DNA. Okay, and so this repetitive DNA is going to make up much of the DNA that lies between genes in humans.
okay? And oftentimes these kind of areas between genes, so we often show like DNA where, you know, here's a gene and then nothing's, you know, nothing's here. Here's a gene. So it's like in the areas that are not actually genes, so not gene, this is where we can start to get this repetitive DNA, okay? So it's not gonna code for a protein. It's gonna be doing something else. Um, it may have no function that we know of, uh, but it's going to be in an area that's not a gene, okay? And so that would be the repetitive DNA. Now, they're often, these segments are called short tandem repeats, which is where the name comes from. Short tandem repeats, okay? And this is often gonna be called STRs. Okay, so these are gonna be short sequences of DNA repeated many times tandemly. Okay, and this word tandemly, if you've ever heard of a tandem bicycle, it means they're kind of two bicycles put together. And so tandem just means one after another. Okay, in the genome. Okay, so if you have like this sequence of, let's say A, 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 T, T, G, you then have it over and over and over again, um, right next to each other. Okay, so this would be the short tandem repeats. Okay, and again, these are gonna be in between genes. They're not part of the genes. So the way that this works with DNA kind of profiling is that when we do STR analysis, okay, it's gonna be a method of DNA profiling that compares the lengths of STR sequences at specific sites in the genome. Okay, so that's gonna be just in the DNA. All right, so I wanna show you what this looks like. So if you look at individuals, so you could look at you know all of us that are in this class, there are these different STR sites that have been identified. Okay, so scientists have discovered these and um, what they what they do is they can then go to the sites and see how many repeats do they have of this short tandem repeat. So for example, in this individual, this uh, repeat is AGAT, okay? And so that is repeated in this time, it has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. It's repeated seven times in this sequence, okay? And it's seven times right here, okay? In this second site, we have this GATA and it's going to have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight repeats. And then in this sequence, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. Okay, so when they're doing the DNA profiling, what they're doing is they look at 13 of these sites all over the DNA, okay? And then they go to those sites and they say, how many repeats does this, does this person have at these different sites? So if this is crime scene data, our DNA, right here. So this is what they found at the crime scene. And this is then the suspect's DNA. What they'll do is then they'll look at those identical spots in the DNA and see, do they match? Now in this individual, this site matches. So the STR site one matches. So if we looked at just one site, we'd be like, yes, this is our person that did the crime. However, you can't just look at one site. You have to look at multiple sites. So if we go to STR site two, we see that this the crime scene individual had eight repeats of this GATA, but our suspect has 12 of them. So there is no way that this individual could be 
the same person, okay? Because that just can't happen. So this individual is always gonna have 12 repeats at this site right here. So if they do this with 13 different sites on the DNA, it is incredibly accurate in determining the right person, okay? And I'll, I'll kind of, I'll give you actually a number in a little bit about the accuracy of this. Now, before we talk about kind of how that's going to um, happen, let me see. Maybe I wrote this down somewhere else. Percent. I'm not seeing my number, but I feel like I, I read something that it was, um, if you use this kind of analysis, it's somewhere between one in 10 billion or one in several trillion uh, possibility of having two individuals that have identical number of markers at the same place. So it's very, very, it would be ex astronomically small amount of individuals that would have kind of the same um, exact STR, patterns in their DNA without it being the actual same person. Okay. Now when we're doing this type of analysis and looking at the STRs, you actually have to do something called gel electrophoresis because that's going to be the next step. All right. So this next step is going to be called gel so this is gonna allow us to actually do the fingerprinting. Okay, and so this is going to be kind of how we do the DNA profiling by STR analysis. Okay. And so this is DNA profiling by STR analysis, okay? And it's going to kind of depend on comparing lengths of DNA fragments. Okay, so normally the DNA is not in fragments. It is going to be in long chromosomes Okay, but this way that we're going to do gel electrophoresis, you actually have to chop up the DNA and you're mainly going to be looking at these sites right here. So the STR sites. Okay, so gel electrophoresis is kind of a technique that is going to separate DNA. Okay, fragments according to size and charge. Okay, and so I'll explain you know, how this is gonna happen. Before we can talk about the actual gel electrophoresis, the main thing is that you have to cut the DNA into fragments you need to use restriction enzymes again. Okay, so you do this restriction enzyme, and we sometimes call it di um, digestion because it's kind of chopping up food, um, like digestion, like food. Um, and so the restriction enzymes Cut DNA at specific sites okay and what they can do is they can do these by those STR sites that we've talked about okay now the way that a restriction enzyme cuts DNA is going to be unique to the individual okay so the way I'm going to put RE for restriction enzyme cuts DNA is unique 
to an individual. And that's why we can call it kind of a DNA fingerprint. Okay, so how does this actually work? So a little bit more about gel electrophoresis. Okay, first of all, the word gel, I want you to think jello, sort of. So it's, it's actually the gel-like structure. Electrophoresis, so electro means electricity. Okay, and phoresis means migration or movement. Okay. And so when we have gel electrophoresis, what's happening is that you're going to run a current through a gel and it's going to be able to move, in our case, DNA molecules based on their size. Okay, so let's see. Okay, so gel electrophoresis involves running a current, electrical current, through a gel containing molecules of interest. Doesn't have to be DNA, but we will be talking about DNA. Okay, and then based on size of the molecule and charge, so whether it's positive or negative, the molecule will travel through the gel at different speeds. Okay, allowing them to be separated. Okay. Now, all DNA molecules are going to be negatively charged. And so the DNA will move because of negative charge. Okay. And it'll move based on the size, so distance DNA travels is dependent on size. So if you remember for diffusion, something that's very large will move slowly and something that's small will move more quickly, okay? All right, so this is what this is gonna look like. Okay, so this is what the gel um, kind of apparatus looks like. You are gonna have this gel right here. It feels sort of like jello. Um, it's made out of agros. It's clear. Um, you make it so that you actually have these little wells, so these little gaps in the gel that you can load your DNA in. The whole apparatus is going to have a power source, so there's gonna be a negative charge on this side and a positive charge on this side. The DNA goes into the wells, and then because DNA is negatively charged, it is going to then want to move this direction away from the negative charge of the current, okay? Because like likes repel. So DNA is negative, and it's going to want to move this direction, okay? Now, after you've done the, the actual um, restriction enzyme, cutting everything. You can then put a DNA sample into the gel, okay? And each of the samples is gonna be separated. There is this additional ladder that we call it, and this is gonna be sort of like a ruler. It basically is of known size of DNA strands. And so then your DNA samples, you can kind of relate them um, similar to what is in here. Okay, once you turn on the actual apparatus,
the DNA will start to move down towards the positive sign, okay? Now, the way that they move is, again, going to be dependent on how big the DNA fragment is. Things that are really big do not move very quickly or very, you know, fast. And so they're not going to move very far away from where they were initially put in. Things that are smaller will move farther down into the gel. Okay, so this is the smallest. Right here is the smallest. And then up here is the largest. Okay, because this moved the farthest away from where it was placed. And so therefore, it's going to be the one that is the smallest sequence. Now kind of bringing it back to kind of the bringing it back to the crime. So here we have kind of samples from different individuals and actually it's not necessarily crime, but it's DNA samples from different individuals. We run it through and then what you can do is you can try to see if you have a match between different individuals. So if there is, if the DNA and they have each of the same lines and fragments at every single spot that they've looked at, that is then going to be kind of what we would um, kind of use as the comparison. Okay, so we'll come back to uh, this specific example. So what we have here is we have the different DNA from the samples. We put them in and compare them. And so then what you would do is you'd come in here and you'd match and you say, okay, well, this one, it kind of looks like all three of them have potentially this first one, but the second one is not, you don't see it here in the crime scene and you don't see it here. So then you would go down and try to match. And so what ultimately you see is that this crime scene DNA matches this crime scene um, or this suspect okay and so this person we would say like this the dna that we found at the site does not match this individual but this could potentially be the person or this is the person's blood that we see now um i was mentioning earlier that there's kind of protocol about how many markers to use so when you're doing str analysis You have to use 13 markers. Okay, so you're not looking at just one site, you're looking at 13 different sites. And the probability of two people having identical DNA profiles is somewhere between 1 in 10 billion to 1 and 1 in several trillion. Don't ask me how they got these numbers, but um, there's some, there. It's it's really very unlikely, like, that's why people, we send people to jail that have DNA um, because the likelihood that it's not their DNA is just so astronomically small that it's going to be that person, okay? Now, kind of moving on from this um, STR analysis and DNA fingerprinting, we can go on to something a little bit different, and this is kind of looking at the whole genome or DNA. And so I've said this word genome multiple times, but I haven't defined it clearly for you. Um, so first of all, let me just mention this. This is DNA sequencing because we have to do DNA sequencing before we can actually do this next step. So DNA sequencing is going to be kind of knowing or finding the complete nucleotide sequence of a DNA molecule. Okay, so knowing the DNA sequencing of a human would require you to know every single location of every gene on every single chromosome. Okay, so this field of science is called genomics. Okay, so this is, is the study 
of complete sets of genes, okay, or the genome. All right, and over um, kind of the last decades, genomics has started to become very, very important and something very big. Now, at this point, we, we know the actual um, full sequences of the genome for multiple individual, multiple different species. They initially started with very simple um, and small genomes like yeast. Um, this one's not yeast, where's yeast? Yeast right here. And you know, this is gonna have a fairly small genome. And then at this point, we've done something like we've done humans, we have chimpanzees, um, this is a water flea. And so they're all of these, what this is showing is the number of genes and then the size of the haploid genome. So humans have very large genomes, um, but they don't actually have that many genes on, those, on the genome. So we have approximately about 21,000 genes that we have found. Um, so there are other things like rice that has um, many, many genes, but has a much smaller genome. And so there's lots of kind of, you know, all over the place. The big thing of wanting to understand and know the whole genome is that we can then start to understand how are things related to each other? How are human diseases um, kind of, how, do, how can we cure them? Can we use other groups of animals like rats? Are they similar enough at those gene sites for us to use them as human health models? This is what genomics is basically allows us to do. Now, the Human Genome Project was kind of the rush to be able to have the full human genome um, and know all where every gene is and everything like that. Um, what they, one of the things that they found with the Human Genome Project is that there is about 21,000 genes um, which is, again, not a huge number of genes. Um, it's kind of in the middle. If we look at this, we have some animals that have 40,000. We're 21. So we're kind of right in the middle of the number of genes um, in our DNA. Okay. It's also allowed us to know that about 98.5% of human genome is non-coding DNA. So that means it's not coding for a, a protein um, or like a tRNA or rRNA and things like that. What most of the DNA, lots of it, we don't know what it does. It's There's unknowns, but we know that a lot of it is going to be those control sequences that we talked about. Okay, so silencers and enhancers and, um, you know, those types of things that we talked about last time. And there's lots of repetitive DNA. So much of the DNA, we don't actually know what, you know, what's going on there. So I think that's kind of things that we thought was not important or junk DNA is actually probably very important, but we just don't know what the, what it is yet. Okay. What the Human Genome Project also has allowed us to do is to kind of look at human evolution. And we can look at not only kind of our living um, relatives, which are non, non-human and uh, mammals that I'll talk about, but also extinct relatives. Okay. So if we look at the Neanderthals, okay, so these are going to be in our same, they're not homo um, sapiens, but they're called homo Neanderthalus. They are going to be a group of kind of human relate relatives uh, they appeared about 300,000 years ago in Europe and disappeared about um, 30,000 years ago they definitely overlapped with modern humans and so um, one of the things that we've been able to find is they they did the genome of a um, 130,000 year old female. They did her genome. And what they found is that many 
um, European and Asian descendants have Neanderthal DNA, okay? Uh, you do not find Neanderthal DNA in um, individuals um, that are from Africa because Neanderthals were a group that were only in Europe. Um, and so only those humans that were actually interacting in Europe with the Neanderthals have that, that actual um, DNA in there. It's a small percentage, I think it's like 2%, something like that, um, that they can actually see in some individuals, okay? We've also seen, so these are gonna be, so the, these were not extinct. So these ones are gonna be not extinct, so they're still alive. These are non-human animals. And the one we're most interested in is our closest relative, the chimpanzee. And they've found that the chimpanzee and humans share about 96% of the genome. Okay, so there is about 4% that's different between us. That difference is massive and it, you know, obviously we are very different from chimpanzees, but we do share a lot of similar DNA. All right. Another thing that they've been able to find is that by looking at the human genome and identifying individuals that have specific disorders and genetic disorders, they've been able to find um, about 2,000 diseases associated Um, with genes. So they can they actually know the genes that, that are associated with those, um, those specific diseases. Okay. Um, they've also, um, one thing that they've been able to do is for specific individuals that have um, really rare diseases and often something that they can't figure out. So there is in the textbook and I might, I'll put it on the, le the lecture PowerPoint. This is not something you have to know, but there was this um, young boy, Nick, and he, at one point when he was a baby, just stopped being able to drink milk and basically could not, um, had to be fed through his mouth or sorry, his nose, a feeding tube. And they couldn't figure out what was wrong with him. And so what they finally did is they actually looked at his entire genome and tried to find where there was a mutation because they couldn't figure out this was something that they hadn't seen before. And so what they did is they looked at the genome, found all the different areas that, you know, maybe are not important. So they got rid of those and they started to identify ones that seemed to be more important in um, specific kind of issues that he was dealing with. And so what they did is they looked at his DNA. And so these are the amino acids. Um, and they looked at a healthy human, a chicken, a zebrafish, a frog, and a horsefly. And what they found is that Nick had a single base substitution that produced a tyrosine amino acid where it should have been a cytosine. Okay, so he has this one base change that is, is basically killing him. They have named this gene, um, it's XIAP, doesn't matter. But basically, this is a gene that is important for digestion. And they were able to figure out that this was the problem. What they did is they gave the little boy um, a bone marrow transplant with donor cells that contain a functional uh, gene for that. And he, I, I believe, is still alive. Okay, but this, the only way that this could happen is if you know the whole DNA, or sorry, the whole genome, um, and try to identify something that is different in that individual in a place where it's important, okay? So we're not talking about like STR analysis where those parts of the genomes, those are definitely different from, from one individual to another, but they don't matter when it comes to genes. So they had to find a, the actual place where there was an issue and they can then identify that and then fix it. Um, so being able to identify those types of things has been really important. Another thing that they've been able to do is to actually just look at the human genetics and try to understand the evolution of humans. And so one thing that they've been able to um, kind of look at is kind of 
the relationship between different groups of people and kind of trying to track how humans um, evolved and uh, left um, kind of where we evolved from. And so the cradle of humanity is in Africa. It's in this uh, Rift Valley right here. This is where the oldest human fossils can be found. Um, but we know that humans started to move out. And so there's this idea, it's called the out of Africa um, theory. And the what they've been looking at is they wanted to see, so how did people start to leave Africa and kind of go um, start moving into Europe and Asia, Australia, and over to um, kind of North and South America. And so what they've looked is they've actually looked at the genomes of different groups of people. And one of the things that they found is that there's a larger genetic difference between within Africans. So you could have Africans from different parts um, of Africa. So they have a larger genetic difference between each other than Africans have to uh, Europeans and to um, Eurasians. Okay, and so what this actually is showing us is that the kind of the people who left Africa, they were all kind of a subset of the genomic diversity of Africa. And so then they're mostly related to each other. And so you can actually see that in the genome. Okay, so again, larger genetic differences within Africans than between Africans and Eurasians. And if you look at the nucleotide diversity in Eurasians, it's basically just a subset of Africans that left. And then those are the ancestors of those people that left are then the, what you see in here. So they're more closely related to each other. Okay. Um, so this supports this out of Africa and that there was kind of a one major move out and then spread out amongst, um, the the world okay and some people obviously stayed and inhabited africa so these are kind of things that you can only do if you know the actual genomes of of humans okay so genomics it's going to be able to allow for us to understand you know evolution it helps us understand gene regulation we can also start to understand genome organization. So why is there a sex chromosome? Why are there sex chromosomes? How long have the sex chromosomes been there? Um, you know, how long have there been male and female? That kind of thing. They can look at the genome to try to tease those put things apart. Now, another area that's kind of similar to genomics is going to be called proteomics. And proteomics is going to be the study of all proteins. So if you remember, proteins are what actually do everything. So yes, we have genes, but we know that many genes can code for multiple different proteins because of things like alternative splicing. And so this proteomics is studying all the proteins that we know of, okay? Now, the last little thing I just want to mention is that there is controversy with all of the different things I've talked about today. Um, so when it comes to genetically modified organism, genetic um, DNA technology, there is controversy about, you know, privacy and also safety. Um, so it is something to be important to understand. Many of the gene genetically modified organisms that are coming into contact with humans have to be tested by the FDA, the EPA, and NIH, and the Department of Agriculture to make sure that they are safe. And so there are scientists that are studying both, you know, how to do genetically modified organisms, but also are they safe for us to consume and interact with. Now, the last little thing I wanted to um, talk about is just kind of an interesting thing. And so you might, you're going to be like, who are these people? Well, this is all about the Y chromosome. And it turns out that the Y chromosome, now that we have been able to sequence it and know what's on it, the Y chromosome does not really change when it goes from um, father to son. So it kind of, so from father to son, uh, it remains unchanged. So what that means is that you can take the Y chromosome of living men and, 
and basically trace them back to kind of where they may have come from. And so some interesting things that they believe they've found is that um, 8% of males that live in Central Asia are thought to have descended from, this is Genghis Khan. So he was kind of a warlord. And then 10%, so this is in Ireland, in 10% of Irishmen, uh, they believe that they were descendants of this man called, I think it's now of um, the nine hostages, okay, which was a warlord in, 14, in the 1400s. Okay, and so what they can do is they can actually, so men can do this, they can get their Y chromosome tested and can kind of trace it back to where we think 